for that. Um, I would like to thank uh, the, um, uh, the uh, chair for the kind introduction and all the organizers for inviting me to give uh, a presentation in this live conference. And hopefully, as what Professor Park said, by the summer of, uh, of the coming year, uh, things would be much better and one can meet other people in person again. So I would like to switch a little bit um, away from looking at cancer biology to talk a little bit about uh, blood disease. And in the, if I have time, I might move back to a little bit about, talk a little bit about cancer and metastasis again at the very, very end. Specifically, I would like to tell you some of our work in using quantitative phase microscopy to um, use it in uh, sickle cell disease um, diagnosis. So um, just for people, since we have a very broad audience, I would like to introduce sickle cell disease, uh, roughly about 200,000 children born every year um, have sickle cell uh, disease. And in US alone, there is about 100,000 people suffering from this disease. Um, Today, the life expectancy and quality of life for sickle cell patient is still roughly a decade shorter than people without this condition. And today, there are very few drugs that can treat this disease. Hydroxyurea is one of them, but it only works, and it's the oldest one, but, that, but it only works for about 80% of the patients. In many ways, unlike cancer, sickle cell disease in many ways is simpler because it is a single gene mutation uh, um, that results in the polymerization of uh, sickle hemoglobin in the oxygenated condition that is known to cause the deformation of the red blood cell and the subsequent um, um, subsequent caulking of the capillary bed in sickle cell patients. And this type of um, caulking of the capillary bed um, is called a crisis event. And it happens not all the time, clearly, but it happens for some of the sickle cell patients once in a while, and it causes severe pain and other physiological damage. That, um, that is really the major clinic, uh, sickle cell disease sy symptom that need to be treated. So um, our approach is to try to understand what is the biomechanical changes that cause the sickle cell to aggregate and clog the capillary bed. So one of the things that we could do using quantitative phase microscopy is to measure membrane fluctuation on the cell membrane, and then subsequently going through modeling of the red blood cell biomechanics relating the fluctuation to the mechanical parameters, we can extract the changes in the mechanical parameter of the red blood cell. Um, and we would like to see whether some of these biophysical uh, mechanical changes uh, can be used as markers to um, understand a little bit better of sickle cell disease, as well as potentially identifying new drugs that can treat this particular disease. So um, I think for this audience, probably this slide is not necessary, but since we have a broad audience, I will go through it a little bit. So the idea of how to measure the um, red blood cell membrane fluctuation is by doing um, phase microscopy that's based on interference. The trick is if the red blood cell have certain shape when you have a optical plane wave fund going through it, the wave fund would be deformed by the red blood cell shape and the change in and the tempo change in the ray fund would be reflecting the change in shape of the red blood cell. And the problem is wave, wave fund deformation does not change the intensity. So therefore we need to um, use an interferometric measurement such that we can convert the phase changes of the wave fund into intensity changes that we can measure. And specifically by using an interferometric setup, we can measure the phase. And if we know the refractive index of the cell itself and also the medium, 
we can calculate the thickness. So, and of course you can use a standard interferometer such, the, such as the Maxander interferometer, but um, it is uh, for many of the biological application, the diffraction phase microscope is much more stable and allow us to measure the wave fun, uh, fluctuation in a much more, um, much more stable manner. The idea of the diffraction phase microscope has um, was developed by Professor Posikil um, nearly 15 years ago. The basic idea is instead of forming an image on the camera, the image is, uh, is generated, the uh, uh, diffraction grading at the imaging plane generate two copy of the image. One of the image go through a pinhole so that it function as a low pass filter. And that generate a plane wave fund that interfere with a second copy that have not been filtered that, that allow you to generate again interf interference and generate a stable interferogram that we can extract the phase information from the red bus cell. So working with some of our collaborator, um, specifically Professor Ming Dao's group in MIT and also John Hickens in my general hospital, we are able to for, um, get a blood sample from the patients and um, and in all, as I mentioned a little bit earlier, in order to measure accurately the phase while uh, the height of the cell, I need to know the phase, but I also need to know the refractive index of the cell itself. The issue about um, the blood from the sickle cell patient is they actually have very different density of hemoglobin in the cell. And therefore the refractive index can be very different. Therefore, before we do the phase measurement, we do a density fractionation of the red blood cell um, in a centrifuge gradient so that we can get a population of the cell that have relatively homogeneous, homogeneous hemoglobin density and therefore relatively constant um, constant refractive index. So by doing that, we can then able to measure the membrane fluctuation for each of the density fraction. That fraction one is the lowest density and fraction four is the highest density. You can see the refractive, uh, the membrane fluctuation for the denser fraction is much lower. And if we plug it back into the um, biomechanics model, we found that the shear modulus of the um, higher density fraction is significantly higher, um, that corresponding to how difficult it is to, to deform the membrane this way, whereas the bending modulus that's corresponding to this type of deformation is actually relatively constant. So we found that the more um, higher uh, density red blood cell tend to have lower fluctuation. And whereas, um, and whereas also that we found that the um, higher density red blood cell tend to be more uh, elongated. So we have high eccentricity. It has lower volume and higher surface to volume ratio. And how does this type of measurement correlated to, for example, the sickle cell disease itself, we can look at patient that's on hydroxyurea that corresponding to the green data to patient that's off hydroxyurea that corresponding to the red data. We found that for each of the fraction, the fluctuation of the, of the, of the fluctuation of the, uh, red blood cell membrane is significantly higher for patient that is being treated by the drug, whereas the fluctuation of the uh, membrane for patient that is not on drug treatment is significantly less. The membrane would fluctuate more as one would expect if it is stiffer. And you can see in the, she uh, in the shear modulus for patient that's on drug versus off drug, 
the on-drug patient CM moderate is much lower, so the red blood cells are softer. And also one found that eccentricity are not a major difference, but the volume of the red blood cell for patient that's on drug is bigger. So in general, you have the patient that's on hydroxyurea have softer red blood cell and also larger cells. And one, one of the reasons that we are interested in the how stiff the cell is, one of the hypotheses is stiffer cell have higher propensity that would clog up in the capillary bed because the cell cannot deform as it go through the narrow channels. And so one of the question is, how does this type of biophysical marker correlate with what some of people know in terms of the biochemical marker that people have been studying related to hydroxyurea. One of the hypotheses people have for the function of the hydroxyurea is that hydroxyurea promote the production of fetal hemoglobin versus sickle hemoglobin. Fetal hemoglobin doesn't have the mutation that um, sickle hemoglobin has, therefore it would not polymerize. So, but one of the interesting thing that one can see is if we take a look at, at either fluctuation or the shear moderates for patient, the same group of patients, because we also measure the fetal to sickle hemoglobin ratio. So if we look at the people with low sickle to fetal to sickle hemoglobin ratio so versus high, um, high uh, fetal to sickle hemoglobin ratio so for fluctuations, none of these differences are significant. Um, on the other hand, we can also measure the volume of the red blood cell. In this case, the modulus and the fluctuation is correlated with the corpuscular volume. That's also what the clinician normally measure. So one of the things that it appeared to show in this case is, um, at least for hydroxyurea, seems like um, the on and drug, off drug stasis correlate with biophysical markers such as corpuscular volume and fluctuation and shear moderates of the red blood cell better than um, the ratio of fetal to sickle hemoglobin. So I just give, want to give us a brief summary of some of our work here. So we saw that quantitative phase microscope is a promising method to look at individual patients' red blood cell populations, mechanical property. And we saw that biophysical marker appear to, appear to have good correlation with whether patient is on or off hydroxyurea. And it appeared that biophysical marker give better correlation than the biochemical marker. And we are looking at the possibility of using some of this bio biophysical marker for potentially for screaming for new sickle cell drugs. So, uh, so I would like to go a little bit further and tell you a little bit about what else that we, we would, uh, what are the issue of the measurement that I saw you a little bit earlier and what we can do in order to do better measurement. So one of the things that I tell you a little bit earlier is we need to fractionate the red blood cell so that we can have a relatively homogeneous population that have similar refractive index inside the cell so we can measure the fluctuation um, amplitude in a quantitative way. So the trick is, is there some way that we can measure both the refractive index and the, and, the, and the height of the cell simultaneously so that we don't need to fractionate the cell, number one. Number two is if we don't need to fractionate the cell and if we can measure both the, um, both the refractive index and the, and the dimension of the cell simultaneously, we can also measure single cell biomechanics that we cannot do in the previous study that I showed you earlier, where we can only measure the biomechanic of a population of cells. 
So one of the things that we realize is that the refractive index of the REPA cell in, is related clearly to the hemoglobin concentration. And there is a known empirical relationship that relate hemoglobin concentration to the refractive index itself. And that allow us to think about how to simultaneously measure the two measurements. I won't go into a lot of work, but there is a lot of previous work in the past past that have been trying to solve the similar problem, but to but until some of our recent work, there is no not a single method that can allow it simultaneously measure both hemoglobin concentration and the shape at the same time on the millisecond time resolution. So we would like to develop a single sort method that would allow us to measure both hemoglobin concentration that would give us refractive index and also the, um, the red blood cell um, uh, dimension at the same time. So the way that we, tr we look at this problem is clearly in order to measure two parameters, we need to make two measurements. So in our uh, quantitative phase microscope, we actually measure two things. We measure the phase, as I showed you a little bit earlier, but our data also have information on the amplitude of the light that transmitted through the red blood cell. And the transmitted light through the red blood cell is determined by, by a attenuation term, the absorption term of the hemoglobin in the red blood cell. So if we take a look at the electric field, you have a phase term that's imaginary and you have an exponentially decaying term due to absorption. So that allow us to, in some ways, um, write, down, uh, write down the equation that describe both the amplitude and the phase after the measurement. And by doing that, we can mesh, solve for the absorption and the phase at the same time. And effectively, if we do that in a simultaneous measurement, we can calculate both the um, height of the cell and also the concentration of the hemoglobin at the same time. I won't go into the great detail, but I just want to point out that it is just solving a couple of set of equation. But there's one caveat in this particular case is this equation is solvable as long as the, um, the medium surrounding the red blood cell has either different absorption from water or the refractive index of the surrounding medium is different from water itself. Um, so as it turns out, properly picking the medium is very important to reduce the measurement error for both the amplitude and the phase. And that in turn reduces the measurement error for the height of the cell and the, uh, and the error in measuring the hemoglobin concentration and the refractive index. So, um, so this is uh, some of our simulations showing that there is optimal wavelength and if we pick certain medium that would allow us to me minimize both the concentration error and the refractive index measurement. Uh, the concentration error and the, and the amplitude uh, and, the, and the cell high measurement error at the same time. So this is some of the data of measuring individual red blood cell. This is the face image and the amplitude image of a red blood cell. From there, we can calculate for, without knowing any a priori information, calculate the height and concentration of hemoglobin inside a red blood cell. That would allow us to look at both the shape of the red blood cell, the fluctuation, and the hemoglobin concentration at the single sort manner. And of course, if you can do it for a single cell, you can do it for a few of cells. And we generally able to achieve a concentration area about 1.4%. 
and a high error about 4%. And in principle, we can push our sensitivity a little bit further and that might allow us to even, um, even reduce our measurement error a little bit better. So in some way, this is pretty good. Um, so so um, question is, can we actually recover some of the measurement that I showed you a little bit er earlier? So for example, we can again separate the red blood cell into four individual factions by using uh, centrifugation. But in this case, we measure the hemoglobin concentration for each fraction using the simultaneous amplitude phase measurement that I showed you a little bit earlier. You can see that all four factions are clearly distinguished and it correlates well with the known density of the red blood cell. And in fact, if we don't fractionate the cell, we can look at for each individual cell and looking at the volume distribution correlated with the um, hemoglobin concentration of the cell, we found that larger cells tend to have lower hemoglobin concentration, whereas, and whereas uh, smaller cells tend to have higher hemoglobin concentration. And you can do the same for surface to volume ratio. So the question is, if we measure the distribution of the, of the cells in, in this particular way, can we, how well is the data correlated with clinical measurement? Um, so in the clinics, um, there are two measurements that, that can be made. One of them is the hemoglobin population of the whole population. So if you feed it into the butt analyzer, the butt analyzer give you one number, um, which is the, um, hemoglobin concentration, the butt and analyzer can also keep you the capsular volume of the red blood, of the population of red blood cell. But the, but the advantage of our current approach is we are not only able to measure the mean of the population because we have the hemoglobin concentration of the volume of each individual red blood cell, we have the histogram. So this is the histogram of the rep hemoglobin concentration for a patient's blood. This is the histogram on the same population of blood for, for each cell's volume. And we can compare the center of the histogram to the total blood map, to the blood analyzer that the clinician use. We can compare the, the mean of the histogram to the capsular volume from the butt analyzer. As you can see, the two give pretty good correlation. And you can do that for multiple patients and you can, um, so that for different patients, you can actually uh, achieve similar measurement again to the total butt analyzer that give us reasonably good confidence that this method not only agree with the standard clinical measurement for the whole population, but we can also measure within the population, the distribution of individual red blood cell physical property, including hemoglobin concentration, the shape and the membrane fluctuation. So one of the things that we have been able, we have been trying to do, which is we are still working on this at the moment, is trying to see whether we can combine all the data together and see whether there is a population of red blood cell that are, have higher propensity to polymerize and sickle and potentially cause the crisis event in the patient. So, so, we tried to combine a number of the things that we can measure together, like surface to volume ratio, viscosity of the cell corresponding to hemoglobin concentration and membrane property. And we combine all of them and generate a parameter, we call it the fitness index, um, basically combining a number of the um, um, biophysical parameter that we can measure using using the diffraction phase microscope. And this is now plotting 
the population distribution of red blood cell for different patients um, as a function of the fitness index. So the calibration corresponding to normal people that have no sickle cell disease, um, each of the bottom four histograms are corresponding to sickle cell patients. If we compare the normal people average population distribution of the fitness index of the normal people compared to the patient, we found that the sickle cell patient tend to have distribution of the red blood cell more on the lower um, fitness index side. So they have more unfit cell compared to the normal patient. So one can actually see this a little bit better by subtracting the histogram of the sickle cell patient with that of the normal people control. And we can see that in generally for the sickle cell patient, you have elevated lower fitness index compared to high fitness index values. And so the question is, is fitness, fitness index a good measure of the difference between, um, between the normal and the, and the sickle cell patient and whether its fitness index is any better than any other measures such as eccentricity, uh, mean fitness, surface to volume ratio, you can see that this is a bunch of different patients. You can see all the fitness index for the patient, at least majority of, the, of them have, have elevated low fitness value, whereas all, all of them um, have similar shapes. Whereas if you look at any of the other index that one might, or part of the index that go into, um, generating the fitness index, the individual index does not correlate with sickleness as well as the fitness index itself. And so we call this method IPAM. So, uh, so in some way, IPAM is a one of the phase microscope with molecular contrast that allow you to do single sort measurement and combining them allow us to look at red blood cell biophysical property on a single, single um, cell level. And right now we do um, IPAM with only a um, single excitation wavelength, but we could in principle do simultaneously with two color measurement that might allow us to not only look at hemoglobin concentration, but we saw sickle versus, uh, sorry, oxy versus the oxy hemoglobin concentration um, that allow us then look at the effect of the oxygenation on the polymerization of the uh, sickle hemoglobin that may allow us to understand the sickling mechanism a little bit better. We also think that we can do further noise reduction using maximum likelihood estimate type approach and, we, and right now we are relatively slow, but we are working to work higher throughput, trying to do maybe up to uh, 1,000 to 10,000 cells per second or so. And I think that I I'm almost out of time. So I think I might stop here in, and not talk much more about beyond red blood cell. And I would like to go to the end and thank people that do most of the work. So, um, Actually, pretty much all the work that I show you here today are done by uh, one of my former graduate students, Puya Husini. Um, and, and today he, he's, he worked it on a number of venture capital company and formed it at least four or five biotech company in the last two, three years. Um, and then um, almost all our work in the face in the face imaging area, we work in collaboratively very closely with uh, Dr. Sahid Yaku. Um, I don't have time to tell you about some of our biomechanics work on cancer metastasis measuring um, um, nucleic mechanics of the nucleic membrane. Those work are done by a former postdoc, Vijay Singh. And 
uh, as I mentioned before, the majority of the rapid cell work are done in collaboration with uh, uh, Dr. Ming Dao, as well as John Higgins and Greg Cato in MGH and Pittsburgh Medical Center. Thank you very much for your attention. I will, I will stop here. <laughs>